Thank you very much for that very warm introduction. I have rewritten my talk about three times in the last two weeks because of events going on in the world. As it is evident to all of you, I'm sure, American politics today are in a state of upheaval and confusion. I observe the Korean politics, uh, perhaps even more so. And I might mention that British politics are just as bad. So what's going on? I know that some dark voices are saying this is the end of democracy, because here are three of the world's leading proponents, examples of democracy in such deep trouble. They say our three countries have had a good run, but we're now out of steam. And they argue that democracy is not efficient enough to deal with today's complex problems. I would not minimize the problems we face. I admit, I admit I'm deeply disappointed and deeply concerned about the results of the U.S. election. I'm similarly concerned about the Brexit decision in the United Kingdom. And I also observe the Korean is going to Korea itself is going to quite a bit of turbulence today, which you understand better than I. But I say, not so fast, not so fast. Let us not write off democracy. Let us take a longer view of history. For four decades, for four decades, the U.S. stood as a bastion of democracy. During that period, many of them, many argued that the totalitarian system within the Soviet Union was more efficient than democracy. They produced, and it produced fearsome military that could be used against us with devastating results. And indeed, there would be short stuff. Instead, the Soviet Union, not because of actions in the United States, but because of internal contradictions in their own system. A political system that did not encourage or allow independent thinking. An economic system that did not reward creativity. So we have learned some lessons in these past four decades. We have learned that democracy in the free market system is vastly superior to any other system around. We've learned, in fact, I think it was Winston Churchill who said, democracy is the worst system, except for all other systems that have been tried. So we have a problem, but still it's the best thing around. But we've also learned that democracy can be messy. You can certainly see that here and in the United States. And we've also learned that the free market system needs some assistance. It needs some regulation to protect the weaker members of society. In the last decade, our free market systems have left behind millions of people, certainly in the United States, and in the United Kingdom. And those left behind have been rising in anger, using democracy to throw out the establishment. So the United States and the United Kingdom are in considerable confusion. South Korea problems are different, but frustration with democracy is similar. But to fix those problems, we must use the same democratic institutions that allow them to happen. The democratic institutions, after all, are self-correcting if we only use those features. That is, I believe that people who use their institutions, institutions create this problem did not use them wisely. But I also believe that we have not seen the last move. According to Churchill again, this was during World War II, he said, Americans, Americans will always take the right action after having first exhausted all other possibilities. Well, history supports the view that we will get it right, but not always right away. Look at the results simply 
1950 to 1990 in the United States and compare them with another reasonable alternative, which is the Soviet Union, which was better. Or look at results from 1950 to today in South Korea and compare them, say, with North Korea. Would any of you argue that North Korea had done better for its people? When South Koreans complain about the weak economy, all they have to do is look north. When they complain about corruption, all they have to do is look north. Of course, when we consider the relative blessings of our freedom and our private economy, we must also recognize that we do not, that they do not, in and of themselves, protect us from outside threats, especially military threats. The United States is rightly concerned about a newly aggressive Russia now rebuilding the Cold War that we're asking. I'll have more to say about that later. But I also want to observe now that South Korea is rightly concerned about an aggressive North Korea now building a threatening nuclear arsenal. I don't want to minimize either of these dangers, but neither do I want to be overwhelmed by them. Today I'm going to talk first about how South Korea should deal with the dangers posed by North Korea nuclear weapons. And they do have nuclear weapons. If you read otherwise, don't believe it. We have an opportunity to deal with this problem at the turn of the last century using the so-called Perry process, which has already been referred to today. I still believe that the agreement we negotiated would give us a very different and certainly a stable world than we have today. But when the Bush administration took office in 2001, they cut off all negotiations with the North. Whatever could be said about the reasons for cutting off that negotiation, the results could hardly have been worse. In short, I believe that this was an historic missed opportunity, and I also believe that we will never, ever get back to the strong position we had in 2000 when we were negotiating that. But today, today, I hold two strong positions about North Korea, and I want to share them with you. The first is they have no plans to use their nuclear weapons to attack South Korea or Japan, or for that matter, the United States. And second, I believe that it's still possible to negotiate an agreement with North Korea. Not the agreement, not the agreement we negotiated in, back 17 years ago, 16 years ago but one that could considerably reduce the danger posed by the nuclear weapons today. And we should get on with recognizing where we are and do the best we can to minimize the danger. When I was working on the Perry process, I put in the report something that is still true today, and I want to repeat it. It says, we should deal with North Korea as it is, not as we would wish it to be. As it is. And as it is today, they have nuclear weapons. You must recognize that and deal with it. However much we may dislike the regime in Pyongyang, they are not suicidal. And they are not irrational. Indeed, they have a clear set of goals. A failure to understand those goals has been led to a dozen years of fruitless negotiations in the six party talks. And if we are to restart negotiations with the North, we must do it with a clear understanding of those goals. I have commented before that a diplomat should be measured not by his ability to use his mouth, but his ability to use his ears and his eyes to observe and come to conclusions from that. So we ought to understand if we renegotiate with the North, what are we, what are we negotiating with? Who are they? What do they want? What are they trying to do? What are their goals? Because if we don't understand those, we will never succeed. We had that understanding during the years I negotiated with them 16 years ago. While the underlying conditions today are very
very different now that they have a nuclear arsenal. I believe their goals remain the same. I saw then, and I still see today, three goals driving the North Korea regime. The first and the primary one is their desire to sustain the Kim dynasty, to sustain the Kim dynasty. That's an overriding goal of North Korea, which they've demonstrated over and over again. Secondly, to gain international recognition. And third, and this is a poor term, a weak term, to improve their economy. The agreements we made in 2000 gave them a chance to achieve all three of those goals without building nuclear weapons. The Bush administration cut off those negotiations early in 2001, and then a few years later joined China in the six-party talks. But the ensuing six-party talks have made no progress at all since they were not designed to achieve the North Korean goals. So after years of failure of those talks, North Korea decided to put off their, all of their efforts into building a nuclear arsenal as an alternative way of achieving the, the goals. They reasoned, I think correctly, that the United States and South Korea would not be willing to go to war over the nuclear program. They reasoned that a nuclear arsenal would give them deterrence against an Allied military attack, which they believed correctly could not be achieved by their large but poorly equipped military forces. In fact, I believe that South Korean forces alone, even without the assistance of the U.S., are probably impossible of defeating the North Korean military forces. Adding the U.S. forces to that made it no contest. So in effect, their nuclear program allowed them to achieve their first two goals, survival of the dynasty and international recognition. And they did that at a very substantial cost to the third goal. Not only because of the cost of the nuclear program, but of the cost imposed by the sanctions. So, while the goal of improving their economy was important to them, it is absolutely clear by their actions that it is entirely subservient to the first two goals. I believe that that is a fair assessment for what has driven North Korean decisions these past few decades. If we are to succeed in future negotiations to reduce the danger posed by the nuclear weapons, we must be guided by failures of the past. A key tenet of the process, I want to repeat again, we must deal with North Korea as it is and not as we wish it to be. And that is still true. For what North Korea is today is very different from what it was 16 years ago. So the incentives and the disincentives we offered them would not be effective today. We cannot, I believe, expect them to give up the nuclear weapons. They have already demonstrated they are willing to endure the worst sanctions we could oppose to maintain the nuclear option, because they believe it is essential to maintaining their primary goal of sustaining the Kim dynasty. But they may very well accept significant limitations on their nuclear ambitions in order to gain their third goal of improving their economy. Some years ago, Dr. Sick Hackett of Stanford proposed what he called the three no's. No new nukes, no better new nukes, and no transfer of nuclear weapons or technology. But it was never accepted as a basis for negotiations. An updated version of Hackett's three no's might very well be a basis for negotiations today, where we offer step-by-step -step incentives and return for step-by-step compliance with those no's. I believe that it's not beyond our diplomatic skills to formulate such a new diplomatic approach. I cannot be confident that such an approach would be effective, but it could hardly be less effective than all of our previous approaches taken during the six-party talks. The question in my mind is 
not whether a new diplomatic approach is worth or but whether our two governments, the American government and the South Korean government, will be willing to try a new one. Much is at stake. As I have said, I do not believe that the North Korean regime would make a planned attack on South Korea or Japan, since that would lead to the destruction of North Korea and, of course, the Kim Dynasty. But their nuclear arsenal could very well involve North Korea to take other non-nuclear actions that were still provocative. And such actions could spin out of control of the leaders and escalate into a war which could eventually escalate into a nuclear war. That is the danger, not the danger that North Korea is going to launch an attack against us. Now, having said all that, let me back away from the Korean issue, look more broadly at dangers, nuclear dangers in the world today. This is the subject of the book which you have heard described. And I wrote the book because I'm convinced of one overriding fact, and that is that the likelihood today of a nuclear catastrophe somewhere in the world is greater than it was during the Cold War. Greater than during the Cold War. And because we don't, we, the public, here in South Korea, in the United States, in Europe, do not understand that. We are not taking the actions that we could take to reduce and to greatly reduce those dangers. The dangers, again, are not the dangers that Russia would attack the United States and the supplies attack, or vice versa, or that China would conduct a nuclear attack, or that North Korea would conduct a nuclear attack. None of these leaders is suicidal. We're not going to do that. The dangers would blunder into a nuclear war. Let me just cite two incidents of history. So if you think that I'm exaggerating the danger of a blunder, at least I have some historical factual basis for it. The dangers we thought during the Cold War were that the Soviet Union was planning a massive surprise attack against the United States. Now, years after the Cold War is over, we realize that was an exaggerated danger. They had the same danger and it was equally exaggerated on their part. But there, there were real dangers, and real dangers were danger of an accidental war, or danger of a war by miscalculation. I am old enough that I lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis. Indeed, I was an active participant in preparing the intelligence reports for President Kennedy, which, on which he based his decisions to this, to that. A very scary event. After the event was over, he reported, he told reporters that he believed there was one chance in three, one chance in three, that the Cuban Missile Crisis would erupt into a nuclear holocaust, which would essentially wipe out our civilization. My response to that was Kennedy was an optimist. He was an optimist because he didn't know when he said that, of some dangers which we didn't, he got our intelligence people to know we couldn't tell him. We didn't know, for example, at the time that they were putting the long, medium range and long range missiles in Cuba, they already had tactical nuclear weapons in Cuba with the nuclear weapons already on them and with the commanders of those missiles with authorization to use them. And so if Kennedy had accepted the unanimous recommendation of his Joint Chiefs of Staff to mount a conventional invasion of Cuba, our forces would have been on the beach with a tactical weapon them essentially eliminated. Not only that, it would undoubtedly have triggered a general nuclear war affecting the whole world. So that's my assessment of what I mean by blundering into a nuclear war, not a nuclear war by miscalculation. Beyond that, we had during the Cold War the possibility of a nuclear war by accident. When I was the Under Secretary of Defense, I was awoken at 3 o'clock in the morning a call from the general at the North American Air Defense Command. And the first thing he said to me, that I sleepily picked up the phone, was my computers are showing 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. I was very sleepy when I picked up the phone.
sono da immediato, immediato che vuoi capire. E non è una maniera di dire, ma è tutto che è una false alarm. And he was calling me at the time I was getting set for defense with research and engineering, so why would he call me? He was calling me because he knew he had to face the president the next one. He wanted to be able to tell the president what in the world had gone wrong with his computer. He hoped I would help him be able to figure that out. Well, the sequel of that story is I was not able to over the phone. It took us three days to finally figure out what had happened, which is when the shift changed that night, the computer operator mistakenly And said, when the operating tape and the computer put in a training tape, was simulated a very realistic operation. It was human error. A similar event happened in 1982 in the Soviet Union, where the watch officer got a similar kind of report from his computer. This watch officer was, happened to be a computer operator. He understood the computer sometimes made mistakes. And he was very skeptical. He refused to pass the message up to the president, who might very well have taken it seriously. Uh, it turned out to be a false alarm. And he subsequently has written a book and a documentary made about called The Man Who Saved the World. So he did save the world. What was his reward for that? His superiors reprimanded him for not following his instructions. So, humans still err, machines still err. We in Russia still have a policy called launch on warning. And so we're still susceptible to that plan. We're still susceptible to wandering in the war, the world of calculation. And beyond those two problems in the Cold War, we now have the possibility of a nuclear terror act. I would say rather, high probability of nuclear terror act sometime in the next few years, and the possibility of a regional nuclear war, for example, India and Pakistan. Without good news, that means this part to say, what are we doing about all this? What are we doing to lower those dangers? What we're doing instead of lowering the dangers, they were repeating all the mistakes we made during the Cold War. Russia is busy building up a whole new generation of nuclear weapons and bragging about it and threatening their neighbors with it and threatening the United States with it. The head of Russian media made a very famous television interview in which he said, and I quote him, Russia is the only nation capable of turning the United States into radioactive ash. Well, of course, that is a true statement. The question of why in the world What do you think that was a worthwhile thing for him to say over public television? In the, of course, the United States is not going to be outdone in this business of doing the world. So we're now starting to rebuild our Cold War nuclear arsenal. The most recent cost estimate of that is over the next 20 or 30 years, we will spend about $1 trillion dollars on our nuclear weapon and operating them. Now, The number of a trillion dollars, I'm sure, doesn't mean anything to any of you. It's a number so vast that you can't really comprehend it. But it's a lot of money. The money, in my mind, is not the biggest issue. The biggest issue is it's just one more step of increasing the danger, putting us back in a Cold War thinking, Cold War mentality, and more back to Cold War dangers. I'm just going to say one more thing about these danger windows, and that is, I think. The reason we are blundering into these positions is that people do not understand the dangers. They do not understand that today we're facing greater dangers than we faced during the Cold War. And so to me, while I'd like to be out there be politically active and fomenting action along the line, I understand we're not going to get in the democracy, we're not going to get action as people understand. So I'm dedicating the rest of my life to educate. The first part of that education, which the book is really about, Living at the Nuclear Bank, which is a selective memoir of that part of my life in which I've been involved in nuclear issues, and why it has affected my thinking so profoundly and made me so concerned with this problem. I want to share that with the rest of the world to get them to continue to understand it so they can vicariously benefit my own experiences.